three people were offered a chance to enter an escape room competition, and the prize for whoever wins gets a prize of $10,000. There were three guys, Mike, Tony and Simon. When they entered the building, a woman greeted them and told them to wait in the waiting room. They all sat down waiting for further instructions. Finally, about 10 minutes later, a voice came through a speaker on the wall. Hello, and welcome to the escape room. There are simple rules. You will have to kill each other, and whoever survives leaves the room with $10,000 and more importantly, their life. They all started laughing until the voice came again. <laughs> ye have 10 minutes to kill each other. If ye don't begin now, then one of ye will be shot dead when the counter ends at O. They were confused, wondering could this be true. When the counter finally reached O, they were shocked as Mike was shot in the head. <laughs> Simon and Tony knew what they had to do. They had to kill the other to survive. Tony pleaded with Simon. Look, this is crazy, man. We need to find a way out of this room. Simon said, I know, let's look. An hour passed and they were exhausted from going through every part of the wall, not finding one single escape route. Suddenly, Simon couldn't take any more and picked up a brick that was on the ground and banged Tony's head over and over, bashing it in, knowing he was dead. Then he started shouting, ye sick bastards, let me out, let me out, I'm the only person alive. He heard something move behind him, guessing it was the door to let him out. But there standing in front of him holding a knife was Mike. He couldn't believe his eyes because he just saw Mike being shot through the head. Mike smiled and said, I know you're standing there shocked, wondering how I can be alive after getting shot in the head. Well, the reason is because there wasn't a real bullet, silly. That was a soft ball full of blood. I am the mastermind behind this game. I love to see what lint it takes for another human to kill. Simon began to scream but couldn't open his mouth as Tony stood up from where he was lying in a pool of blood and said, my goodness, why didn't you check to see? That was a real brick. That brick was a soft prop full of fake blood. Then Tony shot him in the head with a real gun and Mike hit him over and over in the head with a real brick. Then he said, this is a room where we escape our troubles. This is the ultimate escape room. I never wanted to join the Marines, but I got talked into it and it just happened. I was coming home from boot camp I had a bad experience with the military. I was about to graduate boot camp, then on the last obstacle course, I unfortunately got injured. They kept me in this hospital for months so I can heal, but I never healed, so they were forced to send me home. I've been through hell and now I can't even graduate. This sucks, I said. I wonder what my parents would think. On my way home, I really felt as if I let them down. But more, I let myself down, and I was embarrassed for not passing. I finally got home, and everything was different. My parents gave me a look of dissatisfaction. My sister was telling me how hard it was for everyone since I was gone. She told me that during dinner, my parents kept saying, I hope our son is doing okay. My sister told me how depressed they and she became because of not having me in their lives. She told me that they would cry at night because she had no one to talk to and that she would go into my room to talk to me, but then realize I wasn't there and she would lay on my bed and start crying. She told me that they never ate dinners as a family and most of the time they weren't home. They would work extra hours. She told me that I was the light in our family 
and I was what brought everyone together. They made me feel happy after everything I was going through. What I learned is that the Marines isn't for everyone. You can take this as anything else. Just because you try something, that doesn't mean you are going to exceed. But it's the effort that counts, and now you can know your limits and goals in life. It's been a couple of years. I found a pretty good job. I've always had thought of joining the military again, probably a more easier branch, but it just never happened. Between work and school, I've been extremely busy and thought maybe the military just wasn't for me. One day, I was going through my old stuff and I found my letters of when I was in boot camp. I read the letters and started crying. I felt like I let everyone down, including myself, because the letters said that my parents, grandparents, Siblings, aunts, and uncles all believed in me, and I failed them all. I then hear someone knock on the door. I go to the door to open it, and it's my drill instructor. He looks at me and smiles. He says, we have unfinished business left. I look at him in confusion and think, and I remember, I never got injured. I found out the military secret and what they were going to do to me. They never liked me, so they were going to try to kill me. I never got injured by accident. I got pushed from behind and was expected to be killed. But I unbelievably survived, and I was going to tell everyone, but they brainwashed me into thinking that I got injured, and then they sent me home. I looked at the date and saw that it's been exactly three years. Then I realized that the brainwashing wore off every three years and that they were here to brainwash me again so I wouldn't remember. The drone instructor then takes me before I can get away and I wake up on my bed. It's 9 a.m. I'm eating breakfast with my parents and I tell them. I had the most strangest dream and I feel like there's something I need to tell everyone. They ask, what was it? I answered, I'm not sure, I forgot. I just remember that it was really weird and it was about the military. Oh well, I said, it can't be that important. We all <laughs> laughed and continued eating our food. People only love my food when they are starving for two weeks straight. And I know that sounds ludicrous, but I am starting to get known by this very reputation. I have always loved cooking, but ever since high school I have been belittled and mocked for being a terrible cook. I have read and watched every cook show and have always tried to excel at cooking. But unfortunately, I never really had the gift for it. You know, sometimes you do need the talent to begin with to excel at something. And I do believe there are some things you were born to do and other things you were born not to do. Anyhow, a couple of months ago, a homeless man hadn't eaten for two weeks straight and was begging me to give him some food or make him something. He wasn't asking for money, but just something to eat. I decided to cook him something, and people have always criticized how my lasagnas taste, which is basically that they taste horrible. I have become numb to the downward criticism of my food at this point. But when I gave my homemade lasagna to this homeless man, he absolutely loved it. I couldn't believe it, he said. It tasted so nice. But when I gave it to a friend of mine, he didn't like it at all. Then I found another homeless man who hasn't eaten anything for two weeks. And I wanted to make him something. I made him one of my homemade burgers. People have made some harsh comments about my burgers, and once when I tried to do a barbecue for my friends and families, they all ordered takeout instead after taking one bite of my burgers. This homeless man though ate it straight away and he was so grateful as well. 
he said there was nothing wrong with my burger, and it was absolutely amazing. A bulb had glowed inside my head, and it's only when people haven't eaten for two weeks straight, they will love my food. So I invited my friend over, and I tricked him into getting trapped into my cellar, where no phone signal or any kind of technology works. It's one of those places where no signal can get through. I shouted through the door to him that after two weeks of eating nothing, he will love my food. He kept on shouting at me to let him go and he was calling me crazy. I kept telling him that I wasn't crazy and that after two weeks he will love my food and regret ever calling me the worst cook in the world. That I was born to cook. Then I had an idea that if people can only love my food after two weeks straight of not eating, then imagine how much more they would love it if they starved for three weeks or even four. The idea was just amazing and I wanted my friend to absolutely love my food that I may leave him down my cellar for a month or even two months. My friend is going to love my food after so many weeks <laughs> of starvation. I was in high school. I would always get made fun of because of the way I looked or how I sound. I have tried to defend myself, but that never seemed to work. I tried ignoring them, that didn't work. I tried calling them names back, but that didn't make me feel good. I didn't want to stoop down to their level. I was in school walking down the hallway and one of the bullies trips me. I fall right on my face. Then everyone starts <laughs> laughing at me. I get up and run to the bathroom to cry. I hate my life, I said. My life sucks. My life would be so much better if it wasn't for those bullies. The lights flicker, then they turn back on. As I clean myself up, someone else comes in the bathroom, and all I hear is them saying my name. I don't believe in violence. Also, the fact that he is twice my size isn't a fair fight. I tell him to leave me alone and he laughs and tells me if I don't come out from the stall then he will come in. I come out of the stall and tell him that I don't want to fight and that I don't want any problems. He doesn't care. He looks right at me and punches me. I fall to the ground and then he gets on top of me and starts hitting me some more. I'm going to end you, he says. Then the lights start to flicker some more. Then behind him. I hear a voice, get off of him or you will regret it. The bully also hears the voice. He looks behind him and there's nothing there. Then the bully is about to hit me again and then the voice says, I warn you. The bully gets up and looks behind him again. There's this figure, very pale skin with a hoodie and clothes cover most of his body. The bully says, I'm not scared of you. The lights turn off and three seconds later, they turn back on. There's nobody there. It's just me. The bully and the mysterious figure are gone. I was very confused and blacked out. I wake up at home and I thought it was all a dream. The next day, I go back to school. Then I notice that the bully is nowhere to be found. I asked some people. And they told me that they haven't seen the bully since yesterday and that what happened to me is true. That it wasn't a dream. I did get beat up by the bully. Well, I try not to worry about it and live my life. I made a lot more friends and I became a lot more happier. I became the popular kid and now I had to beat up a kid to show that I was in charge of that school. All of my friends looked up to me like I was their boss. I've enjoyed it. It's now been a couple of more years later and I still haven't heard of that kid. Maybe he moved or got expelled for hitting me. Whatever happened to him, it was for the best. As I'm about to leave school, I have to use the bathroom. I go in there and go to the stall. As I'm using the bathroom, I hear a voice. 
the same voice I've heard when I was getting beat up by the bully. The voice said, I liked you. It's a shame that you are a bully. I didn't think too much about it. Then it hit me. Oh no, I said. I tried to run out of the bathroom, but then the lights flicker, then turn off for three seconds. Then turn back on, and there's nobody there. Susan was a regular 17-year-old high school student, but what made her different than her classmates was her father was a famous senator. Because of this, everyone knew they were a very rich family. One day, everything changed in Susan's family when her dad got a phone call for ransom of one million dollars for the safe return of his daughter. He was told if he contacted the police or FBI, she would be killed. He took the deal seriously, but still told the police and they organized a plan. They would try to trace the next phone call. They used triangulation to pinpoint what area the kidnapper was making the call from. But there was a pickup organized in an old bridge that hardly was ever used. Susan's dad knew if the police came, they would ruin the whole thing. So he had one million dollar fake notes printed hoping the kidnapper would hand over Susan and not notice. When Susan's dad Frank arrived at the bridge, the perp was wearing a scarf over his face and asked for the money, then handed over Susan. Frank was delighted to have his daughter back. The next day Susan met her boyfriend, who had been the guy pretending to kidnap her. He said, Hey babe, your dad must really love you to hand over one million dollars just like that. Then he raised a gun to Susan's head. But you must not love me to cheat on me. You must think I'm stupid to not know. You have been cheating on me the last few weeks. That's why I talked you into pretending you were kidnapped to get more money off your rich father. He then shot Susan. Later that day he realized in a shop that the notes were counterfeit and he was arrested. Frank had the notes numbered and an alarm on them to there be a notification when they were being spent. Not only was Susan's boyfriend caught for kidnapping and ransom, but he was also arrested for murder. Good evening. Tonight I'm your host, Mr. Ramsey, and I'll be collaborating alongside the Assassin Rapper to present you this scary uber animated horror story. If you enjoy this collaboration, then please let us know by dropping a like and letting us know down in the comments. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. This happened about 6 months ago, and I recently took an Uber for the first time since this incident, so I thought I'd share. I was leaving a work function at a bar around midnight in a large city, about an hour away from the suburban home I share with my partner. For reference, I'm a woman in my mid-twenties with an average build, not tall, not strong, Definitely not threatening in any way, and I was a bit buzzed that night. I'm talking like three drinks, so not incapacitated in the slightest. Anyway, I'd ordinarily take a company car home, but I hadn't reserved one since I didn't know what time I'd be leaving, so I just decided to Uber. The company reimburses me for the bill anyway, so it was no difference to me. Once the Uber pulls up, I say goodbye to my colleagues and get in the back seat. I'm always very nice to my Uber drivers, so I introduce myself. This driver, let's call him Ed, since I don't actually know his real name, seemed totally normal. No red flags, and we make pleasant conversation for about 15 minutes until we are squarely out of the city on the way to the suburbs. 
From the pleasant conversation, I learned he lives in certain neighbourhood not far from my home. Note that his neighbourhood was relatively nearby. We'd be completely out of the way en route we are taking to my home. The conversation reaches its natural end, so I just stay a bit quiet and start looking at my phone, Reddit, you know, whatever. The quiet is interrupted by his voice, suggesting I take a nap if I feel tired. It didn't even strike me as weird at first, so I just thanked him for the offer, but I wasn't that tired. He then said, oh, I always get sleepy when I'm drunk, are you sure? At this point, something in my body made me even more wide awake than before. I replied that I wasn't drunk and, like I had said, I just had a few drinks so no need to nap. <laughs> I'll be home soon enough anyway, he dropped it after that, but I still thought it was weird he'd say that. About 5 minutes later, he says that the highway had some weird construction going on and that the single lane traffic ahead would make my trip way longer than it needed to be. He asks if it's okay to take another route. I oblige, already on edge and just wanting to be at home. My partner calls at that moment, asking when I'll be home and I make sure to make it very clear I was talking to my significant other. Something was weird about this guy and I wanted him to know that someone is expecting me at a specific time and knows where I am. After I hung up the phone, the Uber driver stays quiet and we get off the highway on a different exit than I'd ever used but I guess that'd be expected on a different route home. I'm bullshitting on my phone because I don't want to talk to this guy anymore, not even looking up until he says, my house is only 5 minutes from here, okay? Pit in my stomach, I'm probably a good 25 minutes away from my house right now, a distance enlarged, I'd later learn artificially, by his shortcut. I say some nonsense about how I like the neighbourhood and how my boyfriend and I were thinking of moving here instead, blah blah basically anything I can think of to make it seem like I don't think this is weird and I'm not picking up on any signals. Surprisingly, he doesn't say anything in response and now starts driving on a road in a direction I knew led to my house. Phew, crisis averted, right? Except, not exactly. 15 minutes to go and my surroundings are more familiar. Just as I'm starting to feel more at ease, he starts asking questions about my boyfriend. What does he do? How long have you guys been together? And other seemingly normal questions. Finally, with about 10 minutes to go, he asks if my boyfriend makes me happy. He does, very much. So I gush a bit and say, yes, he makes me very happy. Then he asks if I make him happy. I thought that was weird. But humour is my defence mechanism, so I say, well I should hope so. 8 minutes away. He turns onto a side street and pulls over onto the side of the road, looks back at me over his headrest and asked if I'd make him happy too. I said, what? Mostly because I can't even believe what's happening. He asks me again. Do you want me to make you happy tonight? I took a second to think through my options. I'm alone with this guy who's behind the wheel. The street is dark and I don't see any lights on at nearby houses. Close to 1am at this point on and at a weekend and I don't know what the hell this guy has in the car. I default to the response many women know to be the true barrier to men's advances. I don't think my boyfriend would like that very much. His weird grin falls away from his face and he says, he doesn't have to find out. Come on, make me happy. I know a few ways, I know a few ways you can start. I tell him my boyfriend is expecting me home any minute and besides I love him and don't want to hurt him, can you please just take me home? I carry a small knife and a little canister of mace but all I could think of was to appeal to this guy's sensitive side. Somehow it worked and he didn't say another word after that, just turned back around and silently drove me home. Weirdly enough, I say thanks as I get out of the car, old habits die hard I guess. And that was that. I got into my house and start crying immediately for some reason as soon as I hug my partner. He tells me I need to contact Uber immediately and tell them what happened so that the guy doesn't try to take advantage of anyone else. I agree and pull up the app to file the complaint. Except when I look at my last ride, the picture on my profile was 100% not the same guy who drove me home. The car was the same, but not the driver. The guy in the photo was brown and wore a turban, maybe early 40s. 
The guy who drove me home was white and seemed just a bit older than me. Uber never followed up with me and just refunded my money. I did tell the police what happened because my partner insisted, but they didn't take me seriously since nothing actually happened. I was worried for a while since the guy knew where I lived, but apparently it's long forgotten since I just took an Uber today. Moral of the story, always make sure the photo on your Uber driver's profile matches the person who's driving the car. Thank you all for listening. I want to thank the assassin rapper for his fantastic animation work, and I hope you all enjoyed. Remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification so you don't miss any future collaborations. I was off of work for the week, so I was playing the Walking Dead game series. It was pretty fun. I got really attached to the characters and into the game. I especially liked Clementine. The game was so much fun, I couldn't put it down, so I stayed up playing all five of their games. Lee was my favorite character. I liked Kenny, then Clementine became my favorite. It's been two days without sleep. I'm on The Walking Dead, the final season. This is the last game, then it ends. Skybound had to finish the series because Telltale had to lay off most of their employees. I honestly didn't want the game to end. I was so involved in the game and in the characters' lives. It felt like real life. I then heard banging on my door. I got downstairs to see who it was. And it was a zombie. I start to panic and realize that none of my parents or siblings are home. That is just me. I start fighting off the zombies and realize that I am outnumbered. I then wake up and realize it's all been a dream. I dozed off while playing The Walking Dead, the final season. After I finished the game, I missed it, but I realized that my sleep and health is more important than any game. I wonder if there ever was a zombie apocalypse, what would happen? I turn off the S-Bots and lay down to go back to sleep.